Okay, and welcome to another tube time on the video about how to build a vacuum tube Tesla coil. Yes, I know it's been a while. Today we're going to talk about coils. Welcome to Tube Time on Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop. I'm going to show you how to wind your own secondary, and also we're going to touch up on the basics of primaries. Now, it's pretty easy to wind your own primary. I mean, you just make a tube out of cardboard and then wrap some wire around it. There you go, primary. Except it's a little bit more complicated than that, so you might be wondering why you see two primaries here. Well, this one is for a solid state coil that I'm going to make which is going to have phase lock loop, it's going to have audio modulation I'm going to add an interrupter to it later, you know, it's going to have a whole lot but um, that's for another video and this coil is for the vacuum tube tester coil that is going to be the focus of this series you may also be wondering why this coil only has a few turns of pretty thick wire while this one has many turns of pretty thin wire. Again, that's because I'm matching the primary to the circuit that's going to drive it. For a solid state coil, you only need a few turns. This one's got about 11 turns, and this one's got about 44 turns. It's not actually critical the amount of turn you have, but generally, that's kind of in the ballpark for what you want for a solid state coil and a vacuum tube coil. So why does this one have fewer turns and this one have more turns? Well, it's because matching the coil to the device that's going to drive it. Now, solid state drivers are low voltage and low impedance. So this one is going to have, you know, maybe 170 volts at the most going through it. Whereas one for a vacuum tube tester coil, you know, this is going to have a few thousand volts going through it. And vacuum tubes are high voltage, high impedance devices. So, need more turns. That way it's more matched to the device that's going to drive it. So... This one is better for vacuum tube tester coils, and this one is better for solid state tester coils. Also, if you don't have really thick wire to wind your solid state primary, you can just use multi core wire like I've used here. As you can see, it's well, if the camera would focus on it, of course. This is three core cable that I've just twisted all the ends together. So the circuit's just going to see one piece of thick wire. And this one, although it looks like it's made from two separate turn, two separate windings, it's actually just one continuous winding because the wire I was using wasn't long enough, so I joined two pieces of wire together and that's how I wound that one. And now on to everybody's favourite part of making a Tesla coil, be it solid state, spark gap or tube, the secondary. Oh boy, this is why I've been holding back on this video. Now when it comes to winding your secondary, you're going to need something to wind the wire around. And for most people, a cardboard tube would suffice. But in, in many cases, cardboard is not really the best kind of thing to use. I've got a 2 inch diameter cardboard tube. And this really is not the best kind of thing to wind a secondary on. Because for one thing, if we have a look really closely, you can see that the layers, instead of being nice and flat, they overlap which is going to make the coil winding a little bit uneven which is something you really don't want when you're winding a secondary it doesn't matter so much for your primary but you want your secondary to be nice and smooth and of course the other disadvantage with cardboard is well, cardboard isn't all that strong so as you're winding more and more and more turns on that's going to compress the cardboard too and that's going to make the windings that you wound earlier become loose and again, that's something you don't want so this is pretty much out of the window so what a lot of people use is plastic pipe. Now I know I said that black plastic pipe is not the best to use because some of them contain carbon to give it its black colour, but PVC seems to be okay to use and I've seen some people use that and have no problems with it. So that's what I'm using here, so we shouldn't have any problems with that. I had to get black because that's all they had, so um, that's what I'm going to have to work with. So, next question is, where to get the wire? Well, you go send some money and get a reel of wire like this. Or you could harvest the wire out of old electronic components such as 
transformers and motors and things like that. And as a matter of fact, this secondary was made from the wire out of a transformer. And I'm going to do something pretty similar with this secondary. This thing here is the little coil of a shaded pole motor or induction motor or whatever you want to call it. And there's plenty of wire on there. And that's what I'm going to use to wind this secondary. I don't know how much it's going to cover, but let's find out. Okay, so now it's time to wind our secondary. And this is the part that I've really, really been dreading. I mean, really, really been dreading. Also, it looks as if this pipe was not cut entirely straight. That's the side that I cut, but uh, the side that was actually cut at the factory doesn't seem to be cut that straight. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a line about a centimetre in. Sorry, I don't know what that is in inches. I'm just going to mark a line. And the reason I'm drawing this line is because I want to put some double-sided tape down at this end. And you'll see why in just a minute. But I want it to be nice and straight. So that's why I'm drawing this line. And then when I put the double-sided tape down, I'm just going to line up the edge of the tape with this line. And it will be nice and straight. So there we go. The double-sided tape is on there nice and straight. So I'll just peel off the backing. And now I've got something to wind the first few turns onto. And anybody who's ever wound a secondary will tell you that those first few turns are always the most trickiest. So that tape's going to hold them in nice and securely and it's going to make the job a lot easier. Okay, so we're almost ready to start winding wire onto this thing now. But first, I'm just going to draw another line and this is going to mark where my secondary is actually going to start. And the other thing about that is I can use that line as a guide when I start winding the first few turns. So I can keep them nice and straight. I can line them up with that line and we won't get a skewed coil the double-sided tape is going to hold those first few turns nicely in place and that's going to make the rest of it a lot easier. Okay, so let's wind a few windings on, trying to keep it lined up with the line that I drew. Doesn't matter if the first turn or so is not all that good, as long as the rest are okay. Also, you don't want the wire to break. If you, if you break your wire, it's game over. You have to start all over again. So anyway, I'm going to wind the rest of the windings on. Now, you could put double-sided tape all along the thing, but I found that adds a little bit of space between the turns, and you don't really want that. You want the turns to be as close as possible, so just using a bit of tape for that first few turns or so is perfectly fine. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank people who have donated to Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop. I now have about 35 quid in my PayPal account. And I've just got to go and find somewhere now that accepts PayPal so I can get the parts for the next part of the video, such as the capacitors that I'm going to need. And also, this video here that you can see in the bottom corner of the screen, I've re-uploaded it and I've made it unlisted. So if you want to go and see that, just click on the link and you should be able to see it. Anyway, I'm going to continue winding this and this is going to take pretty much forever, but let's see how this turns out. Alrighty then, wound a secondary, took many months of hard labour and toil, but it's finally done, and I've still got a little bit of wire left on there, there's maybe even enough to make another coil. I don't know how well you can see it, but right here you can see where the double sided tape ends, because it kind of separates the turns a little bit. So they're not as closely packed together as they are along the rest of the secondary. And that's why I don't like to use double-sided tape along the whole tube. I learned that the hard way when I wound this one. I mean, you can see there's tons of bits where it's just been loosely wound because of the double-sided tape. But that secondary is still going to be good for things like solid state tester coils and things like that. Now the only trouble is, I accidentally cut this a bit shorter than I wanted to. I finished winding it, but I just want to stick a bit on the end and then put a few loose turns on there and then I'll finish the secondary. The only thing that will be left after that is to... Oh, I've just lost my smaller wire. Wind my feedback onto the bottom of this and it will be done. Okay, so here is the completed secondary. I've glued that little bit on the end and made a few loose turns and now I want to wind on my feedback coil, which is going to be wound onto the bottom end of the secondary.
So here it is. The finished secondary. Lovely. Okay, I'm not going to talk like that. So here we are. This is the finished secondary. With the feedback winding wound onto the bottom, as you can see. That's about 15 turns, give or take. Doesn't have to be exact. I mean, I don't even know how many turns the actual secondary is, or even what gauge wire I've used. I'm just going to stick this in with VTTC and see how well it works. But first, I gotta test it. So we've got the bottom connection here, which is our feedback, and then right here is our ground, and at the top, the other end of the coil is connected to the breakout point, and I've gone and sealed where the wire comes out with hot glue so we won't get any hopefully we shouldn't get any arcs coming out of the side of the wire where it's bent over going to the breakout point and I'm going to use a very simple circuit to test this coil sorry for getting in the way and ironically despite the name of the circuit that I'm going to use to test the coil it's really not all that exciting yes I'm talking about the Slayer Exciter it's a very simple circuit it's just one transistor, a heatsink that's way overkill for this circuit, but that's what I just what I happened to come across first in my parts box. A couple of diodes that can be thought of as one diode, and a resistor, and of course the two coils. So let's give this circuit a little bit of a test. I'm going to power this on 12 volts, which should be plenty enough to make the circuit do something. Alright, so I'm going to turn this on. Okay, so power is now on. So this should be generating high voltage, so I'm going to see if I can arc... Okay... Good, that appears to be working. Let's see... I'd say this is generating about 3000 volts right now. And of course, when I use this in the vacuum tube tester coil, it's going to generate a whole lot more than that. Oh yeah. Weird there. Well, I'm gonna say that works, so... Now what we gotta do is we gotta find out the frequency that this thing is gonna operate at. Alright, okay, and um, here's how we're gonna do it. Now there are two ways we can do this, but it will require that you have either a frequency counter or an oscilloscope. There's just no two ways about it, you're gonna have to have either one or the other. This is a nice cheap meter that you can get, this multimeter. It's got a frequency counter built in and can measure up to about 10 megahertz, so that's going to be so that's well within what this circuit's going to do. So let's just power this up from this little battery here. So we know it's oscillating. The way I'm picking this up is that this meter is not actually connected to anything. I've just got one of the test leads hooked up on the wall there, and the other one. And it's just dangling down onto the floor, so that's acting like an antenna, picking up the output from this coil. And the same pretty much goes for the scope. I just got a bit of wire stuffed into the input there, and that's just hooked up on the wall there to pick up the output from the coil. And the reason why I'm powering this off a battery is because I tried powering this off my homemade power supply, but the trace on the scope was really fuzzy and I couldn't really see what was going on. And it appears to be much cleaner if I power it off Although the antenna is picking up a little bit too good, so uh, that's actually I've got that scope set on the maximum voltage right now, and already that's overdriving the scope's input, so I'm going to have to make that antenna shorter or move it further away. Alright, so I'm just going to move this way up there. So hopefully that will pick up a bit less like that. But if you don't have a frequency counter like what I've got here, there's a way you can interpret what you see on the scope 
and get the frequency from that. Okay, now I know my scope isn't the most camera friendly scope, so you'll just have to bear with me. I'm just going to turn up the backlight so we can see the divisions there, because I've had to turn the lights, I've had to turn all the lights out so it can see the scope screen, even though it looks perfectly visible in normal light, but I'm just going to up the battery, not battery, battery. What we're going to do is we're going to see, we're going to measure the length of one cycle, which we're going to take it from there to there. Let's see how long that is. So that's one square, two squares, three squares. I said that's about 3.3 3 squares. 3.3 3 divisions long. I don't know why my coil interferes with my microphone so much. At various points in the video, I might just as well have been going... For all you could hear of me. Okay, it's time to work this out now. And you're gonna need a calculator that has a lot of digits on it. So that's why I'm using the Windows calculator. Okay, so first what we need to do is put in the scope's time base, which in this case was... 0.5 microseconds and because it's microseconds we divide that by 1 million and then we multiply that by the amount of squares the waveform took up or the amount of divisions the waveform took up which in this case is 3.3 then we just take the inverse of that and there you go it's that simple there's the frequency, 606,060 hertz, which is close enough to what I would in the meter, so, uh, and, you know, that's accurate enough, so, um, yeah. But wait, that's the resonant frequency we would get if I was to use this coil as my primary, which I'm not going to, because this is the coil I'm going to use as my primary, and all things are going to affect the secondary's resonant frequency. So let's see what the frequency is with this coil. And it's about 614 megahertz. So, not affected that much, but wait again. If we want streamers, we gotta take into account how they are going to affect the frequency, because they will. So, if I'm expecting, say, 4 inch streamers off this coil, all I gotta do is take a piece of wire, about the same length as the streamer, and just put that on like that. This is our substitute streamer. And let's see what the frequency is now. As you can see, it's dropped quite considerably. It is now 563 kilohertz. So I think I'm just going to round that off to 570 kilohertz, and that's the frequency I'm going to go for. Okay, so for the next part, you are going to need an inductance meter because we're going to measure the inductance of the primary so we can work out what capacitor we need. And as you can see, 151 microhenry. Now the thing is, there is so much that can affect the inductance of the primary, you would not believe. A bit like how the resonant frequency of the secondary can be affected by the primary you're using, and the length of the sparks it makes. Also other things are going to affect it, like what you had for dinner last night, whether you're doing this on Venus or not. But anyway, this is with the secondary inserted and grounded, and as you can see, our primary's inductance is 151 microhenry. Now, if I disconnect this from the ground, you'll see. Now, I've disconnected the secondary from the ground. The inductance has changed. And in fact, if I remove the secondary, it changes yet again. But since we're making a Tesla coil, which involves the secondary being inside the primary and grounded, we need to measure it like this. So now what we need to do is find the capacitor we need to tune the primary. Okay, so what we're going to do is use this online frequency calculator. And I'll put a link to this so you can use it for yourself. But um, I'm just going to set this up. I want the frequency in kilohertz. And I'm going to be working in nanofarads. And microhenries. Okay, so... We know a coil is about 150 microhenries. So let's see what happened if I put a 2.2 nanofarad capacitor. What will that give us? 
277 kilohertz, so we need to go further than that. Right, okay, I've plugged in various different values, and turns out that the appropriate capacitor that I'm going to need is about 519 picofarads, and that's going to give me about 570 kilohertz, which is the frequency I agreed on earlier. So that's what we're going to do. Yeah, now I know what you're saying. There's no such thing as a 519 picofarad capacitor. Where am I going to get one of those? Well, you don't have to. You can do what I've done here. And I've put four capacitors in series. Each one of those is rated for 10,000 volts at 2.2 nanofarads. So when I put those all together, it's a little bit less than what I wanted, but it's close enough. Yeah, so the circuit's going to operate on a little bit higher frequency than what I wanted it to, but it's good enough. Anyway, it would be rude of me not to power this up and see what we get, so um, let's do that right now. Turn on, and let's see if it does anything. Well, I don't think there's much to worry about there. Now, that was ballasted. Let's just turn out the lights so we can see this a little better. That was at least shooting out three inch sparks, so that's really nice. Doesn't look as good on the camera for some reason. I think the, um, I think the sparks are a little bit too fast for the camera to capture, but um, let's just try it a little bit. Now, I'm just going to do a little bit of a temperature check on the capacitors because these are not the ideal capacitors to use. You saw it worked, but let's just make sure that they don't get super hot. Now, they're a little bit warm, but um, full. let's do this full power. Alright, actually, just before I start the thing, there's no properties, the camera, I'm just adjusting my camera, because I have to do this while it's recording, although I think that's yeah, going to be alright. Alright, so, okay, so I've turned off the pesky autofocus, and now, okay, so I've turned off the pesky autofocus, so let's see. How uh, well it works. Awesome. Okay, now I'm just going to do another short run. Okay. Let's see. Alright, now I'm just going to do that again. Just run it for a few seconds, see how hot the capacitors get. Yeah, they're only very slightly warm. But anyway, that's it for this video on how to build a vacuum tube Tesla coil. In the next video, I'm going to get some better capacitors to use than these. And... We're going to investigate into staccato controllers, and that will be the final video in the series, in the series on how to build a vacuum tube tester coil. So, until next time, goodbye. Okay, and just before I go, here is the circuit for all to see. Now, rather than just draw this part along here, which is the actual circuit for the coil itself. I thought I'd include the power supply parts as well, just so you can see it all. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Now, um, if you watch my video on making a power supply, you see here this capacitor says 2 microfarads. Well, actually, that's two capacitors in parallel. Same with this capacitor here, that's two capacitors in parallel. And, as you probably know, this capacitor here was made from four capacitors in series. And, um, well, that's pretty much all there is to it. The Cool Dude Clem Vacuum Tube Tesla Coil.